could clarify to the online people that that's why we're always like said, we're even more sort of people. Yeah. <laughs> okay, welcome back, everyone. We are going to get started with our uh, final talk of the morning. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to uh, introduce Dr. Helen Byrne, who I think everybody in this room knows who she is, but I still need to say that she is someone that you all know has played a very significant role in defining the foundations of mathematical oncology uh, over the years. And we are very fortunate to have her here speaking with us. This is the second of a series of three talks. And um, I just wanted to say that she is the well-deserved winner of many awards, including being an SMB fellow. And I think just this year, getting an honorary doctorate from Chalmers University in Sweden. And so I just want to have you give a very warm welcome to Dr. Helen Byrne. Thank, um, thank you, Lisa. Oh, you can hear me okay, I think, if you want to hear me. Um, so, just um, like to say it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I really enjoyed, particularly last week when we had time to chat with the sort of postdocs and people staying here. It's a lovely, lovely environment. Um, and so I thank you for letting me be with you. So my talk is going to be a little bit different from the other talks you've heard this morning and also from the talk I gave last week. It won't be as long as last week's talk either. Um, so what I want to tell you about is um, um, an area um, of um, application that is still relatively new to me, but one which I think has a lot of potential for us working in oncology, particularly when we think about the huge amounts of very detailed data that um, we have um, increasing access to. And so um, what I thought before we go into the applications, we'll do um, TDA 101. And really what I'm going to be talking about is a very simple sort of method in topological data analysis, which is based on something called persistent homology. Uh, I am not a pure mathematician. I am not a topologist. But um, I hope that what I want to give you today is just a flavor of how I think we can incorporate these methods, both in terms of analyzing our data, but also when we're thinking about validating our models against data. Um, OK, so what's TDA? It's about looking at the shape of data. And we're actually all very good at doing that anyway. You look at all of these different images, you see a circle, even when the circle is a bit noisy. Um, and so what we try to do with TDA or what we want to do is take data, which might be noisy, point clouds in particular, and try to quantify the structures that are in that data. And that might be looking for loops, it might be looking for other types of structures, depending on whether the data is 2D, 3D, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a whole host of different methods that you can use. But uh, just let me walk you through as a very simple example. You can see here a 2D point cloud, blue dots around a 2D plane. And again, you can see it looks like those points are on a loop or in an annulus with a bit of noise added on. So how can we sort of quantify um, that, that structure in this data? And so what we do here is we put a little circle on each of those dots and we gradually inflate its radius. And um, then what we're gonna do is see when two of those circles overlap, we connect the two dots together to form a single connected component. Okay, so uh, the idea is we put circles or disks on each of our points and we gradually increase the radius of those circles and we see how that changes the connectivity of our point cloud. So as I mentioned, gradually increase the radii and you can see examples where at a particular value, 
the two disks overlap. And so we connect those points together to form a single connected component. And if you look on the right hand side, you'll see that I've got two sort of uh, bar charts, if you like. One is called H0, which is keeping track of how many sort of um, single um, connected components there are in my data. So initially, when the points are just of radius or at very, very small radii, I have as many bars as there are points in my data. As I gradually increase the radii and points fuse together, then I kill off one of those bars and I continue another one. So you can see the, the top panel there is giving me a readout of how many connected components there are in my data at a particular value of the radius, my filtration parameter, which is the radius of the disk. And so we can keep going with this and we can see how these bars, when, they're, when, when they disappear in H0, but what we can also do is find higher order structures. So it's a little bit difficult, I'm, I'm sorry about the lighting, but we can also see structures where if we have pairwise intersections with say two, three different um, disks, but there's a hole in the middle, we form a loop. And it's, there is actually a loop in the middle here. And so what we're doing in the bottom panel is we're trying to keep, keep, keep track of those structures. And what you can see is that loop is born at a particular radius of the disk. And as we increase the radius, it may become um, filled over so it will die. So we can keep track of when features in our data are born and when they disappear and when they die. And then the length of the bar will be an idea of how persistent that feature is in the data. So that's basically the idea, so let's keep going. And now you can see as we increase the radius, we see the loop that there are, our eyes are very good at tracking. So that's born at um, whatever this value is. And you can see as we keep increasing, increasing the radii, then it persists, and but eventually it disappears, okay? So this readout, um, we have two barcodes for this data, one which gives us, if you like, so they give us a multi-scale signature of the structure of the data, okay? And features that are long-lived, that have long bars, they're sort of things that are quite um, strong features in the data. So you can see that um, the central loop that we can see visually is a very long feature in our barcodes. Okay, so that's that's basic idea of what we're going to do. And we're going to try and apply this methodology to biological data. Okay. And what I'm going to try and do is walk you through three different examples. I'm kind of conscious of time, so we'll see how, how we're going and how you're looking. Um, and uh, just to kind of illustrate the ways in which we can apply these sorts of ideas, integrate them with um, mechanistic models, and also do some slightly more sophisticated extensions of the basic persistent homology that I just described to you. Um, so the first example is going to be looking at um, the um, characterizing the structure morphology of tumor vascular networks, and really sort of the eyes, again, are very good at seeing that this is abnormal normal, but particularly when we have 3D data, what are the structures, what are the loops that we can see present in the vascular networks, and what does that tell us about um, the tumours? How do those structures change over time? And in particular, how do they change in response to treatment? So I guess the questions that we want to answer in, in this application is trying to understand how the architecture of the vasculature changes over time with tumor progression and also in response to different therapeutic agents. Um, and I guess an additional sort of, um, so those I guess are very um, uh, architectural things. They don't necessarily, the, the, the key thing that I think is of interest here is trying to link those morphological changes to the function of our vasculature. So some of the things that we are interested in in particular, or our experimentalists are interested in, is trying to 
predict based on the morphology of the vasculature, is this tumour going to benefit from vessel normalisation strategies? And I guess the idea there is that if we, say, remove some of the blood vessels, will that actually improve the blood flow, increase oxygenation levels, and therefore render the tumour more sensitive to treatments such as radiotherapy or chemotherapy? So um, those are some of the questions that we're interested in, in answering. Um, so what does the data look like? So we have two types of data, both 3D imaging, either from live 3D imaging, where we can follow the same tumour over time, or we have um, a sort of um, a static 3D imaging, which will enable us to go across the full depth of the tumour. And we're looking at um, animal experiments where we have uh, control untreated, we treat with different vascular targeting agents, and we also treat with radiotherapy. And I guess one of the, th the nice things about this piece of work is it really allows us to quantify the impact of these different things. So I think prior to this work, I don't think people had sort of been able to really quantify the impact of radiotherapy at such, in such detail uh, to see actually what effect it's having. Um, okay, so um, here's the data and it's, as I said, it's 3D data. It's really, really big. Uh, and I guess when Bernadette, who was the lucky, unlucky postdoc who did this work, when she was trying to do this sort of a few years ago, the TDA software, it was like full of bugs. I mean, it was really challenging piece of work, but I think the field's advanced an awful lot now, and many of these methods are sort of more widely available. Um, now, when I described the sort of TDA 101 a moment ago, we looked at putting um, discs on our point clouds and inflating them and looking um, at when discs overlapped. We tried that with this data, and I guess, as I said, this data is huge. And if we tried to put dots all over it and do our filtration, it, it, it's still computationally prohibited. So what we actually do is subsample from this um, uh, network, and we do that repeatedly to sort of work out what the structure is. And I guess the second difference is rather than doing the filtration that I described before, what we did here is to sort of put, um, gradually put a, say, a, a sphere at the center of our vascular network and gradually inflate it. And what we would do is see which points from our subsampled network are inside that disk or not. And then we can generate our connectivity in terms of connect, keep track of connected components loops. And because this is in 3D, we can also see higher order structures. We can see voids. So um, where we've got a hole in 3D at the center of our um, uh, um, vascular or point sample points. So we can generate a lot of uh, morphological information about the structure of um, the vascular network. And I guess sort of the proof of the pudding is in the data. And I guess what we've done here is um, looked over time. Um, and I guess this is ultra microscopy where we're able to follow the same tumors over time and the sort of brownie orange data is giving you the growth of untreated. Um, the treated um, group here have been given um, an antiangiogenic drug and I guess prior to this um, again difficult to quantify the actual impact of some of these um, different um, vascular targeting agents. And so on the uh, left hand side what you can see as the untreated tumor grows, so the number of um, uh, um, uh, loops in the in the network is increasing. As um, so, I'm just looking. Uh, yeah, you can see that the number of loops as the tumor is growing is also increasing. In our treatment group, you can see how we detect a sort of marked change 
in um, the number of loops. So it's giving us an idea of how this drug is actually working. We can also look at other um, features of the data. We can see uh, changes in the number of voids, but hopefully you can see the sort of general idea of what we can extract from the data. And I guess additionally, um, so this is now looking at um, the impact of the radiotherapy on the structure of um, the vasculature. There are two different cases here. The orange or the very pale color is the untreated like we had on the previous slide. We look at fractionated where we give, I think, two grays a day, or we can do a single dose of 10 gray and then follow the tumor over time. And so you can again see in a similar way as we saw on the previous slide, um, if we look perhaps just at the loops in the interest of time, untreated, then the number of loops increases over time. When I give my, my um, large dose, I see I kill off a lot of the blood vessels, I see a reduction, but then I see quite rapid regrowth. With the fractionated treatment, it sort of holds steady, we see a decrease, and then we can see a slight rebound. One of the, I guess, additional nice things about the data that we had is we can also do repeat this analysis in regions of our vascular network. So we can see how, so the pie chart on the right hand side is if, if you like, each um, third of it is telling you something about the, um, I think it's numbers, numbers of loops. So this is the tumor center. So you can imagine we've got annually coming outward from the tumor center and we can quantify the numbers of loops in each of those annually and see how that changes over time. So in particular, that enables us to see how following radiotherapy, whereabouts is the response happening? So we can actually also get, in addition to, I guess, um, coarse grain information about the overall behavior, we can also look and see where the angiogenic response or the response to the treatment, whereabouts that is localized. So that really, I think, hopefully gives you an idea of some of the ways that we can use these methods to pull out information that I think would be very difficult to extract sort of by visual inspection. Now, you may or may not be asking, well, that's all lovely. It's very complicated. Is it really worth the bother? And that's yeah, a fa fairly fair question. And so what this slide is really designed to do is sort of give you an idea of the correlation. So you can also pull out a whole range of more standard statistical metrics like numbers of branch points, average vessel length, average vessel diameter, and so on and so forth. And so what we were doing on here is trying to look at correlations between our TDA metrics and other sort of more standard statistical metrics. And I guess in order to do this comparison, so our sort of topological metrics are multi-scale, the statistical metrics tend to be scalar. So in order to do this comparison, we have to do a data compression. But even so, we can see some correlations between, say, loops and uh, branching points, et cetera, et cetera, which um, in a sense, I think what that's telling us is that these um, multi-scale topological descriptors are sort of capturing the within them um, many of the standard statistical. So it's like a one-stop shop. You get buy one, get several free, I think is perhaps a way of thinking about it. But we also get extra information, as you can see from the sort of um, structure that we're able to pull out. Okay, so that's sort of like... Um, I think, um, first example. And I guess if we think about that, so that's very nice and we're able to, to actually quantify some of the very detailed imaging that we see. And we can use that to compare, say, um, different tumors. We can use that to quantify the impact of different, say, vascular targeting agents. So it actually gives us a way to compare tumors, which I think would be quite difficult just by visual inspection. Um, but I guess the problem with that is we don't know what the ground truth is. Um, and so the next study is really then trying to um, road test those methods by um, challenging them with synthetic data 
that's generated from um, an agent based model. Um, and so I guess, yeah, here the idea was sort of trying to um, understand the benefit or compare um, the ability of our topological descriptors to more standard descriptors to characterize vascular networks when we've kind of, we know what the ground truth is, we know what parameters we use to generate, that we know what the underlying model is, okay? And um, this is, again, joint work with Bernadette and um, John Nardini, who I think is known to some of you. Um, so, and for simplicity, we just took um, a tried and tested model by um, Sandy Anderson and Mark Chaplin from some while ago. Very, very simple um, agent-based model. So we have a tumor on the right-hand side, which is producing antigenic factors that diffuse stimulate the endothelial cells in neighboring blood vessels to form sprouts that migrate by chemotaxis towards the tumor. The tips fuse together to form loops. Um, so we can either have tip to tip anastomosis or a tip might come into contact with a pre-existing vessel, tip to sprout. And we can also have bifurcations where a tip might split into two. And so um, we can encode all of this into our model. I guess the thing I should say is that the cells, the endothelial cells are performing a bias random walk in response to both uh, chemotaxis due to angiogenic factors produced by the tumor, but also haptotaxis in response to gradients in fibronectin in the underlying ECN. So it's a very simple model, but I think it's one that's well known and um, uh, well studied. And so we use this model to generate a bunch of different networks, and we just varied a couple of parameters, in particular, the endothelial cell sensitivity to our chemotactic and haptotactic stimuli. And as we varied those parameters, we can generate a bunch of different qualitative behaviors, as you can see on this slide. So anything from very sort of stunted angiogenic response to um, ones that run across forming not very many um, uh, loops and to very dense um, networks. Um, so a whole host of different sorts of structures. And so what we can now do is try and apply some of those topological methods to characterize these different patterns. Um, well, we can also, so let, let's think about standard descriptors perhaps first. And on the very sort of standard end of things, the sorts of uh, quantities we might um, wish to capture are things like uh, how many vessel segments have I got? So in this particular case, four. How many tips have I got? Three. Um, those might be. And also, what's the depth of penetration of my, my vascular front? And so those are sort of fairly sort of um, standard things things that we can pull out of the data and record how those things change over time. And I guess this slide is just talking, walking through um, a few, um, these three different simulations and showing how those different quantities change over time. Okay. Um, now, uh, we can also, if we want to think about some of the topological features that we had when we were doing um, TDA 101, then the sorts of things we, we keep track of are connected components and loops. So just to talk you through, so here we have two connected components. You can't get from there to there. So we have beta naught connected components equals two. We have one loop, so beta one equals two. Here we have one connected component. You can get to all points on the network. There are no loops. In the picture on the right-hand side, we've got one loop, and one connected component. So you can see how you can sort of characterize the structure of the network, both in terms of standard numbers of tips, number of segments, et cetera, et cetera. But we can also put on top of that some of these additional features that tell us something a bit more about the architecture of the network. Um, there's, again, a question here about how should I filter my point cloud? How should I filter my data? So when we looked at the 3D vascular architecture, we put a, a, a seed at the middle of the 
the tumour and we gradually inflated it and we looked at points that came into the domain over time. With this, because it's a 2D simulation, what we decided to do was to do what we call a sweeping plane filtration. So if you imagine we kind of can sample our network, put points at different points as the um, uh, network evolves, and we sweep, say, from left to right, and we can do look at the connectivity, numbers of um, uh, connected components and loops, et cetera, as we sweep from left to right. So this plays, the position of this line plays the same role as the radius of the disks when we were doing the first sort of um, simple example. So we can sweep across this network from left to right, we can sweep right to left, bottom to top, top to bottom. And we can compute these descriptors, standard descriptors, topological descriptors for different positions of our um, uh, sweeping plane and characterize the structure as we advance across the network. Um, I hope that makes sense. And this just gives you an idea of, of the readouts that you generate if you, uh, let's get this right. So if we sweep from left to right, then you can see this brown line is telling you, I think, um, yeah, it's telling you how many connected components there are. So there are whatever, I think about 10 sprouts at the beginning. As we go across, you can see whatever, I don't know what's happening there, but then some of them will fuse together and so numbers go down. If we sweep right to left, you can see initially there's no sprouts and you can see how the numbers of connected components are changing. And I guess importantly, these are not the same. Uh, we can also do the same thing, keeping track of the numbers of loops in the data. And we can do that in all the different directions. And so what we can generate then is um, our descriptors will be these sorts of readouts combined with, um, well, I think, I think that's on the next slide. Um, so this just gives you an idea of we can do this across all these different types of networks and we can come up with these standard descriptors and topological descriptors that characterize the sorts of networks that we see as we vary the parameters that are used to generate the network. Okay, um, so the methodology then is we've got our agent-based model. We run loads and loads of simulations varying the sensitivity of the endothelial cells to chemotaxis and haptotaxis, and that generates our synthetic data. Then we do our data analysis, we generate all of the standard descriptors, and we generate these topological features. In truth, we do a number of other types of filtrations, but I think in the interest of time, I won't go through them all. Um, Suffice to say, we generate a lot of information and data about the structure of the vascular networks. And then what we can do is we can um, form vectors, we can concatenate the different sort of descriptors and use those to do data clustering. And we use k-means clustering, and then we can sort of look at how the networks partition under if we just use the biological descriptors or the standard descriptors, topological descriptors, et cetera, et cetera. How does the data partition and does the partitioning have anything to do with the parameters that we use to generate the networks? And um, so this uh, is really showing you what we found, which was really quite annoying was if we just use a single descriptor vector, so maybe one of our sweeping uh, uh, filtration left to right or something like that, then we couldn't get the data to cluster in a nice way. Uh, what we found is if we take two topological descriptors, and so what's shown on here is taking pairs of them. Um, so this is looking at um, now, am I gonna get this the right way around? top to bottom, and I guess that's looking at connected components, left to right uh, loops. So there's all different combinations. And what this is doing is showing you how, if we take the networks that were generated for each of those different parameter values, and we cluster them using, um, by feeding in the topological um, features, then the clustering looks like this. So all of the points on this diagonal are put 
considered to be similar. Likewise, all the black ones. And so you can see how, depending on what information we put in, then we cluster different sort of networks together. And I guess um, whilst they seem to do quite a good job of clustering all, all of these different combinations, um, I guess this is not great because it's treating these and these as sort of the same group. Um, and what we find, I guess, is that some of these, like this one and the one on the top right, are doing quite a good job of partitioning parameter space into different clusters according to the parameters that we use to generate them. And indeed, what we can do is if we take um, one of those pairs of combinations and we look at our um, topolog double descriptors and we do principal components analysis, this is just looking at the first two descriptors and you can see how the data are indeed um, clustering into different subgroups according to the topological descriptors, which sort of map back onto parameter space. And I guess we can play around using elbow curves, et cetera, et cetera, to work out what number of clusters it's appropriate to, to um, decompose the data into. And so I guess the idea, or, or, or the take home message of this study is really to show you how we can use a mathematical model to kind of look at the insight that's provided by using these sorts of topological descriptors. And I guess what I should say is that I haven't put the results in for using standard ones. It's in the paper if you're interested. But I think we find that we can partition the data based on these sort of outputs into groups that partition the parameter space in a sort of sensible way, cluster together networks that were generated with similar parameter values. And I guess in um, taking this a step further, you might then ask if these, these are essentially outputs or the topological descriptors you can think of as outputs from observing the data. And what was done in this um, sort of follow-on work by Heather Harrington, Tom Thorne and others is trying to use those descriptors to do ABC, to do parameter estimation and inference. And in sort of ongoing work, what we're trying to do is generalize that to compare different mechanistic models. Can we distinguish between them by applying these sorts of metrics um, to the, um, these sorts of topological descriptors to the networks that they generate? So I think I hope that sort of gives you an idea of how we can integrate these methods with um, uh, mechanistic models to sort of maybe do parameter estimation. And again, I think sort of what we're interested in here is then using the topological descriptors as a sort of um, middle ground between the biological data and synthetic data, because to actually try and compare them is going to be pretty much impossible. Or how do you say this network is like this one? And I think using these sorts of descriptors provides us with a means in, by which we might be able to do that. And if we can tack onto that inference and parameter estimation, then hopefully we might be able to learn something about parameters that might have generated real biological networks. So I guess, and oh uh, yeah, we've done sort of a few bits and pieces extending this. And one, which I think there's scope for doing uh, further extensions is applying these methods to uh, data from retinal images. Again, you sort of sometimes wonder why you study cancer because it's so horribly complicated. Uh, here, we try and apply the same methods to retinal vasculature, which fortunately tends to live in a, more 2D type of world. And what we were able to do is show how we can um, partition uh, our retinal images using these descriptors into, dis we can distinguish healthy and diseased um, uh, uh, networks. I think there's a lot of scope to kind of develop this. We didn't have, I think we need a much larger data set in order to kind of go much further with that. But I think it's promising. Um, how are we doing for time? Shall I? No, you're fine. Am I okay? Right. Okay. So uh, home straight. Um, so this is um, a more recent piece of work. And what we're interested in doing here, and I guess that sort of perhaps comes back more to the particular focus of the network, 
is really what we're interested in is trying to understand how um, the structure of the extracellular matrix, how that impacts um, the ability of immune cells to hone in on tumor nests within um, um, tumor tissue. Um, and can we learn anything about um, how the architecture might be permissive or inhibitory for uh, immune cell infiltration? And I guess, so this is going to be a study based on lung cancer. Um, and I guess pathologists are very good. You show them a bunch of images and they'll say that's whatever it is. It's papillary, it's solid, whatever, just by visual inspection. I guess what we're wanting to do now in the digital pathology world is to actually be able to quantify images so that we can do better comparisons, recognizing that, that it's not really sort of a binary, you're in one class or another, that there's typically um, a spectrum. So one of our objectives is can we more, and, and I guess also you give pathologists, two pathologists the same image, you give the same pathologist the same image at different times of the day, they're not always reproducible. If we can have methods, then hopefully we can um, eliminate some of that, although they are still, I, I would say, pretty good at classifying things. So question, as I mentioned, is how does the ECM architecture impact the ability of immune cells to infiltrate into tumor nests? Um, and this is work which was mostly done by Iris Yoon, um, really great um, postdoc who's now a faculty position in the States. And so the first bit of this is really just characterizing the structure of the extracellular matrix using very much the same methodology that we use for the vascular networks. So we get images like this, we can subsample where the extracellular matrix is, we do our persistent homology, what we're doing here is just capturing, rather than the barcodes, we've kind of done a slightly different representation of the data. We look at on the x-axis is when does a particular feature appear? And on the y-axis that indicates when, at what disk radius that feature disappears. So it's, it's death value. And if you look at the difference between the birth and the death, or death and the birth, that gives you the persistence, i.e. how significant or long-lived that feature is in the data. Um, and sort of, I guess, probably, maybe this is a bit of information too far, but so we can generate these sorts of persistence diagrams summarizing the features that are in our data. But if we want to do statistics and we want to compare them, how, how can we do that? Because, and there are ways to do it, um, but you may have different numbers on features, on different, generated from different images. And so one of the methods that we've kind of um, used, developed to try and facilitate, make it easier to compare them is to, um, we vectorize um, the birth and uh, persistence of all of the topological features. And then we um, uh, project them onto a grid of a finite size, put a Gaussian, which is of strength proportional to the persistence, and in that way, we can generate this sort of um, persistence image, which summarizes the features in the data. Now, you might think that's what a lot of extra work that is, and that would be true. But the advantage then is that these persistence images can have the same dimension, so we can easily do statistics and comparisons between them. So that's, that's the reason why, why we go through all that extra pain. And so we can characterize the extracellular matrix patterns across a bunch of different um, uh, lung cancer patients. And if we do that and then do some sort of dimensionality reduction, so I guess I should say here, we take, um, I think we've got about 45 or so different patients. We, um, for each of them, we have very large images. We split them into smaller regions of interest perform this analysis on each of those, and then we cluster the, um, the readouts, our persistence images from each of those different regions of interest. And then we use UMAP to do um, clustering. And what you can see here, I'll give you an example of what these different clusters look like. 
what we can see is this cluster one, this large brown one here, is really picking up what looks like fairly healthy tissue, low densities of extracellular matrix. And as we walk around these different clusters, what we can see is that the, the architecture of the extracellular matrix, how it's changing and sort of mimicking um, disease progression so that by the time we get over here, we've got something which much more dense, looking like a solid, quite um, a sort of pathological um, tissue matrix. And this is, I guess, when things, your lungs have become so stiff that it's very, very difficult to breathe. Um, and the, the map on the right hand side is just giving you a sense of um, the differences, sort of a distance metric comparing each of these different clusters. So adjacent clusters are kind of closer, have smaller, smaller distance metrics. So that sort of tells us that these metrics are able to characterize the different sorts of um, extracellular matrix that we see and to quantify it then the question, and it suggests that cluster one is close, close to cluster two, et cetera, et cetera. But what does this look like if we look at the spatial embedding? Um, um, oh, sorry, what happened there? So um, I guess if, if we look at the data and the distances, it, as, I, as I think I said on the last slide, we, we, uh, if we do sort of, we can do so, pseudo time analysis and that would suggest that the progression of ECM is going from say cluster one through two to three. Then we seem to have a bifurcation point where you either go via four and five and end up at eight and nine, or you go this way based on um, a pseudo time analysis. Okay. Um, so um, I guess more, perhaps more interestingly is we can now go back to our whole slide images and we can look for a particular patient at which, how each of those um, regions of interest, how those are classified, what cluster they belong to. And is there any relationship between adjacent regions of interest? Are their um, cluster IDs similar? Um, what I hope you can see from either the image here you can see that um, we've got blues and purples close together. So it's sort of consistent. It's, it's suggesting that the pseudo time analysis is being sort of um, recapitulated in a spatial environment. So for example, we're seeing um, clusters of type six, seven, eight close to each other. And I guess what that's suggestive is you might have um, at the leading, edge of your invading tumor where you're adjacent to healthy tissue. You'd see um, clusters of type one next to two, et cetera, et cetera. And the spatial adjacency matrix in the bottom right is kind of telling you what the distance is between different types of clusters in terms of on um, the spatial embedding. So um, it's sort of suggesting that we can almost get a time course from looking at the spatial distribution of the different clusters on our whole slide image. Um, so that's, that's great, but remember what I said we were going to do right at the beginning was we want to sort of, so we can characterize the extracellular matrix, but does that have any sort of influence on where my immune cells are relative to the cancer cells? Um, and then, so that sort of begs the question of how do we characterize the, relative spatial distributions of the immune cells and the cancer cells. We can do a similar persistent homology and we can look at where the immune cells are relative to each other. We can look at where the cancer cells are, but how do we compare different cell types? We can use spatial statistics. And I think we heard some of that yesterday, but we can also do an extension of persistent homology, which is called Dauka persistent homology. And basically, I think in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through the diff but basically the idea here is with the persistent homology we looked at before, you have, uh, you put your discs around your cell type of interest, you inflate the radii, if they overlap, then I connect them. In this particular case, what we do is we do the same construction on our cells of interest, but we connect two points if there's a, there's a cell in the middle that's of the other type. So that cell you can think of as a witness, 
right? And so that's what you're seeing here. Um, so I've got two types of points, uh, uh, dots and crosses, and you can see, so I put disks, say, on the crosses, and if those disks in the region of overlap, there's a, uh, there's a dot, then I connect those points together. And we can do the same sorts of construction. And what that does is it gives us some, tells us something about the relationship between the distributions of my crosses and dots, or between my immune cells and cancer cells, or between my immune cells and extracellular matrix. Okay, but I think in the interest of time. So I guess the uh, just to try and wrap up because I'm conscious of time. So what our sort of, if you like, full analysis now is we can analyze using persistent homology. We can characterize the extracellular matrix. We can calculate, characterize cancer cells by themselves, immune cells. But we can also now start to look at combinations. Where are the immune cells relative to the cancer cells? And I guess one of the nice things about the Dauka persistent homology is if we're in dimension zero, which was connected components for persistent homology, that will track things like boundaries between. So if you look at this particular example, you can see immune cell exclusion. And some of the features that are coming out of our persistent diagram, the sort of magenta highlighted uh, points, are corresponding to these interfaces that you can see in the pictures on the right hand side. So the dimension zero persistence diagram is giving us um, an indication of where there are interfaces between the two cell types of interest. The dimension one, if you remember, that was loops when we were doing basic TDA. What that's giving us now is shared loops between the two cell types. Where are they both, for example, um, where are the two cell types perhaps um, localized around perhaps a necrotic core, for example? And you can see an example of that on the right hand side. So we, we can, um, by making this extension, we can start to get more subtle information that would be very difficult to quantify just by looking at these images. And so you can do that. And again, this just shows you how, again, we can basically compute all these different uh, topological descriptors, do principal components analysis. And what we're finding here is that this is just telling you, if we take the first two, we can see how this new um, extension is telling us something about, um, well, in particular, the first principal component is giving us an, uh, um, a steer about the level of immune cell exclusion. So dots, the pinky dots on the right hand side correspond to the images that you can see on the top right, where we have co-localization of the two cell types. If we go to the orangey dots, low first principal component, you can see immune cell exclusion. So these methods are um, able to kind of pull out quite, I think, subtle features in the data that would be, uh, I think, more challenging to do using other methods. Um, and then we can put all of these things together. We can look at progression in terms of the extracellular matrix and, and layer on top of that, this information about where the immune cells and the cancer cells are relative to each other. And we can go back to our pseudo time analysis and we can start to pull out features such as, as you move across those different clusters, how does a cancer cell density change? How does the leukocyte density change? And how do some of these Dauka, these sort of more complex topological features, how do those change? And I guess the patterns, the panels over on the right hand side are sort of trying to show you, in a sense, as we progress through um, from a normal long architecture to either a highly fibrotic, very solid like or to one, but which has still got some cancer cells and immune cells or to one which is really very, very um, dense and solid-like. It's not got so many cancer cells, but lots of immune cells. So I guess, um, I hope um, that gives you a flavor of some of the ways that we can use what might seem quite sophisticated methods, but I think they can um, tell us a lot more 
about the information that's available in the imaging data. And I think additionally, it sort of provides us with um, a point of contact or um, a middle ground with which we can sort of link together the imaging data and our mechanistic modeling data. So I hope that wasn't too, that was um, okay to listen to. Uh, so we've kind of come from characterizing vascular networks, using our TDA to show how we can do that to um, classify or test the sort of um, ability of those TDA metrics to cluster data according to parameters that we use to generate them and or to do inference. And I guess at the last bit, showing how we can generate more sophisticated metrics to give us more detailed information at the, about relational distributions of different cell types. And um, yeah, there's various other things that we've done, but I think you need a break now. Um, and just finally, I should acknowledge all of the people, I think I've tried to do that as we've gone through, um, who contributed to the work. And if you're interested, uh, very happy to um, take any questions and thank you for listening. I, I see, I was thinking I was finishing at half 12 and that's why I was getting really, really nervous. That was why I was going fast. Yep, yeah. yeah, so, um, okay. But now we have time to discuss. Yeah, good. So, um, I think there might be somebody in the chat. Hi, nice talk. Um, Ro uh, sorry, we're doing names when we do this before. So Rowan Barker Clark, McLean Clinic. Um, I was wondering why, um, so I, I see you using point clouds and they're kind of one of the easiest things to apply um, persistent homology to. Have you had a look at um, cubicle complexes? Uh, and obviously when you're using vascular networks, they aren't actually point. Yes, so. I, I, I agree. I, uh, we haven't done, I mean, I think when, when we did this work, which goes back a few years, it was that was bad enough thank you very much but i agree with you i think what would be very nice is go back and do this and particularly i would say the same sort of uh criticism should be leveled at the ecm if we can see because we can see fibrillar structures and i think that it would be nice to go back and compare the sort of because i think those will be more difficult but um what do you get extra for the extra pain um, so I think that's, yeah, very good question. And I totally agree with you. Um, that's very interesting. I heard part, part of this before, but I was wondering, um, you know, you mentioned how the persistent homology, you know, shows up features uh, which persist across scales, uh, also captures global structures. Um, um, so that could lead to uh, new biological insights. In a sense, could you think of it also as helping to uh, point at fundamental mechanisms in biological systems because you're identifying ro robust patterns or structures yep. and these can reflect maybe biological processes, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's lots and lots of uses and I guess um, without doing this down, uh, I think there, to me, I would like... Um, or what we are developing is a portfolio of different metrics with which to characterize the spatial structures that we see. So topological, uh, spatial statistical network theory and trying to analyze these images using a, a sort of raft of different methods and see where are we seeing robust features. Uh, and I guess in particular, where are we seeing differences with disease progression and or response to treatment? Mm -hmm. uh, just one quick question. Yeah. The, the Dow curve persistent homology, yeah. um, uh, how does that differ from the normal definition? Because Dow curve theorem gives you some sort of um, uh, duality between two. Yeah, so I problems. think, you, yeah, so there is a duality between, so I'm sitting on one cell type and I'm using the second cell type as my witness. And so on the slide, because I, I was thinking I had to finish at 12.30, I was going very fast. So um, the other, oh no, we don't want backup slides. I think we'd be here for too long. Um, la la, wherever it is. Yeah. 
this is kind of doing it the other way around. And so, you, yeah, you do have a duality theorem. I mean, I guess that's one of the things which I didn't say. The nice things about the TDA in comparison to some of the other metrics is they are, I guess, at least backed up to some extent by uh, stability theorems, et cetera, that the, the metrics that we're pulling out are robust to some extent to noise in the data, which I think is, is um, an extra sort of value. Um, yeah, but you're right, there is a duality. Question that is a little bit technical. Uh, you said here. Yes, hello. <laughs> you, you said that uh, some of these data sets are computationally prohibitive to deal with the entire thing, and then you sample. Uh, I would imagine that in some of these, like if you look at this pathology or some data, say, uh, if you look at different regions, uh, you would get different results. Uh, how do yeah. you? So how do you combine that? How do you take into well, account? Well, so in, indeed, that's exactly what we've done. Here's, oh, here's okay. the whole slide image okay. uh, where this is. So I guess typically what a pathologist would do is they zoom in on the worst region, don't they? And I guess what this is doing is, is telling us the landscape across all of that. So we've analyzed all of those images and then projected it back down so that you can sort of read off the sort of signature of each region. Sorry, am I answering your question? I'm not sure if I am. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm yeah hitting it properly. Fantastic talk, also sort of related to. Okay, uh, we'll try again. <laughs> Dorans, uh, no, no, but more, but also technical. So in the middle example, the one where you have this in silico. Yep. Uh, mechanistic. So um, if I were to apply these techniques, I what would make me choose? your um, uh, a plane that moves or line that moves in either direction as opposed to say increasing the sizes of circles and doing the yep. standard yes. TDA why would I use one or the other in fact why did you use one well so in other? fact we did try a number of different again because I was thinking um, we tried a number of different types of filtration okay so we also did one where what's called flooding so you can sort of sit on the network and you flood outwards Mm -hmm. You kind of color adjacent squares with distance and you can then look at what are the sort of structures that are in as, as you gradually fill up the grid. So we tried a bunch of different sorts of ways of filtering the data. And, and to me, this is one of the, the questions. I, I don't know, is there a right filtration to use? At the moment, we're trying different things and we're seeing what happens. What we found with, with this study was um now i can't remember it may well have been the flooding ones were I, I can't remember which were better i think it might well no i think it was left to right whatever but we did try a number and it's it is not obvious to me what is the right filtration to use so so to follow up on that right if i don't know the ground truth now in this case you had the ground truth yeah. to check against but if i don't know the ground truth then it's not clear to me how would i decide right i mean it's one thing to say i know the ground yeah. truth so i can compare see yeah. which method is the best but if i'm a user and i don't know the ground truth yeah. right then we got a problem so well um, no i think yes you have to be careful and i would suggest that you should try um several different methods um so i i guess for yes i think i I, I think we haven't got enough experience of using these methods to know okay. if there is a right, it, it might be a bit like doing asymptotics on a, a dynamical system, which can, you know, where are my boundary layers or which way should I non-dimensionalize a system? Um, and I think at this stage, we're still, well, certainly I am still trying to work out what is the right way to go. So, um, and, and, so, and also follow up on that, uh, well, parallel. Um, when you compare with metric information, you, you call it statistical, I would call mm -hmm. it maybe metric, but so metric versus topological, you yeah. know, so the more standard things we would do. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't understand from the lecture, it, did you show that you do better than people who do with yes, standard you techniques? Do. Well, I mean, so, right. It's difficult to do that comparison because you have lots of... Imp so when, when we were doing the paper, one of the referees was asking us to do a comparison, right? But 
the topological output is a multi-scale summary. The standard sort of statistical metrics are scalar. So to do that comparison, you're, you're projecting down. So um, in order to do this sort of correlation diagram, we have to lose information. What you can do and what we have done in other studies is we can show you can regress out other features from the topological descriptors. So we've done some other work looking at the shapes of organoids where we can regress out area. And I mean, again, so I think because these are quantifying the structure over length scales, you're getting more bang for your buck, if you like. And so you can see that by the fact that you're seeing correlations between loops and multiple of the standard descriptors. Um, sorry, that is the best that I can do, but I, yeah. Okay, well, so that people can go to lunch and come back. And I think we said formally we might try to reconvene around 2.30 in the groups, but if you can organize with your group and you wanna reconvene earlier or at another time, feel free. And also thank you to Helen for being willing to shift her time <laughs> so that some of us can go see the magnificent Niagara Falls this afternoon. And thank you for a wonderful talk. Thanks again. Okay.